coming. Um, it's great to see old friends and new. Uh, my name's Erica Berman. I'm um, Professor of Education here in MIE and um, a member of Manchester Psychoanalytic Matrix uh, as well. Um, I'm here as a, partly as a group analyst. Um, I'm delighted that we have this session on psychoanalysis and science with Ian Parker, who is the convener of Manchester Psychoanalytic Matrix, and Chris Dunker, um, who is a um, very well-known psych... Oh, and Ian, of course, is a psychoanalyst, as you know, as well as uh, honorary professor here in MIE. Uh, and Chris Dunker is professor of uh, psychology and psychoanalysis in the University of Sao Paulo in Brazil, who is... Um, dropping in on us on his way to Paris to launch his new book in, or new tra newly translated book in, into French. You can read it in French or English if you like. <laughs> and um, the theme for today, going to get on with it quickly, um, is, uh, is psychoanalysis and science. Is psychoanalysis scientific, I suppose, is the question. I was wondering whether we should put hands up, yes or no, but maybe that's... <laughs> Silly way of looking at it. Um, anyway, I, um, I'm going to sit here in case anyone else appears on the Zoom link. Um, uh, Ian's going to speak first for around 20, 25 minutes, and then Chris, and then we'll have a kind of broader discussion. Thanks so much for coming. And sorry, just to say sorry about we're going to have to finish at quarter to five yeah. because Chris is going over to this student encampment at five o'clock to do a talk there. With Ian. Welcome to as well. Yeah. Okay then, right. Uh, I mean, to answer the question as to whether psychoanalysis is a science or not, I think we need to know what we're talking about when we refer to psychoanalysis and science. And this isn't easy because these are contested terms. Uh, I, I count myself in the same gang as Slutty Bartfast, who is a great fan of science. Um, and I'm also a great fan of psychoanalysis, but that doesn't mean that I would go so far as to say that it is scientific when I want to, to defend it. Uh, I don't think psychoanalysis is scientific. So my starting point is that psychoanalysis is not a science. However, whether we're fans of science or not, I think psychoanalysts need to understand how science works and how it functions as part of a broader cultural, historical, political nexus, and as a crucial part of a reasoned approach to the world, a world in which we listen to analysands in the clinic. And, and by the same token, we need to understand something of the appeal of anti-scientific, irrational, quasi-mystical, and today, conspiratorial theories that analysands sometimes dwell on, the theories that dwell in them, the theories that dwell in us as well. So we, we need to navigate the split between science and non-science. And we need to navigate the split in such a way as to avoid getting drawn into either side. So each side of the split is really complex, it's easy to caricature, and I think it's, it's tempting to move too fast in defining those two key, key contested terms, psychoanalysis and, and science. In fact, I think a, a strict watertight definition of science is as difficult to arrive at as an agreed definition of psychoanalysis. So you need to bear that in mind in what follows. Now, one thing that characterizes psychoanalysis as a practice of encountering subjectivity, of listening to subjectivity emerge in speech, there we are, that's the kind of definition, is that it borrows concepts and strategies from science and from alternatives to science. So we can see ambiguity and contradiction in at least five fields of debate five fields of debate that I want to focus on to extract some elements that might be useful in thinking about psychoanalysis as a practice that is not itself scientific, but is indebted to science, that exists in relation to science. And these five fields that I'm going to talk about briefly are a kind of hermetic reading of Freud, what he said to guide us, 
an internal critique that questions what we mean by science, a critique of images of science in the realist tradition, uh, fourthly, conceptions of science as a language game, and finally, studies of scientific practice that configure scientific practice as a form of knowledge. So, let's get on. The first is, uh, is going to Freud. And, of, of course, turning to what Freud said as our touchstone itself raises questions about scientific procedure. Why should we go back to one individual's writings as the founding texts? We don't usually do that in other sciences, but we're psychoanalysts and this is what we so often do, so here goes with that. Freud warned us back in 1926 at the end of a book called Inhibitions, Symptoms and Anxiety. He warned us against making what he is saying into what he characterizes as, and I quote, a cornerstone of a psychoanalytic Weltanschauung. A Weltanschauung is a, a worldview, a complete worldview, okay? And Freud's suspicion of turning psychoanalysis into a Weltanschauung, or worldview, is, as he puts it, uh, in opposition to uh, an intellectual construction which solves all the principles of our existence uniformly. That's how he defines the worldview that he's trying to avoid turning psychoanalysis into. And this is uh, ex explicated in more detail in his later book, New Introductory Lectures in Psychoanalysis. So basically it's no worldview. And that is also precisely what we must avoid in summoning up Freud to tell us whether psychoanalysis is a science or not. Instead, and this is where it gets a little more tricky, and I think this applies to psychoanalysis, we should, Freud accept, uh, says, accept that there are no sources of knowledge of the universe other than the intellectual working over of carefully scrutinized observations, right? But that doesn't mean you're a scientist when you do that. That just means that you're engaged in the intellectual working over of carefully scrutinized ob observations. So uh, uh, what he's describing there is, is quite handy and it kind of qualifies his double argument. And the double argument is that on the one hand, he says, it is possible to speak of a scientific worldview, or Weltanschauung, use it, uses that word, scientific Weltanschauung, but on the other hand, he says that that's not really a worldview at all. Itself, it's not a worldview and shouldn't be treated as a worldview, but it's marked by what Freud refers to as negative characteristics. What he means by negative characteristics is that you're always putting things into question, always putting things into doubt, always trying to find non-confirming instances in, in the work that you're doing. So he concludes that lecture by repeating that psychoanalysis is not capable of creating a worldview of its own. And he says that uh, psychoanalysis is and he puts it this way, and I'll return to this later a few times. He says, it's a part of science. It's a part of science, but it's not a science as such. And I think this is a, a subtle but important uh, distinction. Along the way, by the way, Freud also provides an argument which uh, functions as a kind of parallel example to psychoanalysis, where he says, that Marxism is a theory that has attempted to displace religious worldviews and has itself acquired what Freud says as is the self-contained and exclusive character of a Weltanschauung, of a, of a worldview. And, and it's interesting that he spends a bit of time on this, and I think he's absolutely right. He's giving warnings about what happened to Marxism in the Soviet Union that then rebounded upon what happened under psychoanalysis, uh, uh, to psychoanalysis under capitalism. Uh, so I agree with him that it's a mistake also to turn Marxism into, into a, 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 a worldview that uh, 
portrays itself as a science that is able to explain everything. And I, I say that speaking as, as a Marxist. So the second uh, uh, field of debate that I want to talk about is internal critique. Freud has to explain the meaning of that term Weltanschauung, and it's something that the uh, translators of the standard edition of the complete uh, works of, of Freud, what they gloss into English in their footnote as a view of the universe. The Weltanschauung is a worldview, where Weltanschauung is a view of the universe. And uh, then, and this is why I've been using the word Weltanschauung, then the translators use the German term in the rest of the work. They, they keep using the term Weltanschauung because they find it difficult to, to translate uh, accurately. So clearly, there are um, culturally, historically specific resonances of this term that then frame the culturally, historically specific phenomena that Freud is exploring. And we know, of course, that translation is fraught with problems, including, ironically, the translation of psychoanalysis into quite different um, uh, 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 languages. It's also the translation of psychoanalysis into a scientific discourse when it was translated into English, which was actually a scientistic discourse, that is a discourse that mimics science. And that's what the translators of the standard edition were doing when they tried to render Freud into English, because they wanted to make it seem like it was a science, and then it would be taken seriously by the other scientists. That's the game that they, they were playing. Now, it's precisely that problem that drives Bruno Bettelheim, who was trained as a psychoanalyst in Vienna before he moved to the United States, it's precisely that problem of translation that drove, that drove Bruno Bettelheim to notice what had happened to psychoanalysis when it was adapted to taken for granted images of science in the English speaking world. And Bettelheim retranslates key psychoanalytic terms from German to try and do justice to what he sees as Freud's concern with psychoanalysis. And he uses the, the phrase man's soul in the title of his book, Freud and Man's Soul, which is also called an indication of how language always, always frames and excludes what it refers to. Um, but it's a really good book, Freud and Man's Soul, published in 1986 in English, is an excellent book. Uh, to, to, to look at the, the problems of translation of psychoanalysis into the English language. At stake here in Bettelheim's argument is exactly the kind of concern that Freud seems to have in his discussion of psychoanalysis and science as worldviews of approaches to knowledge. And there were, Bettelheim points out in his book, there were two quite different scientific disciplines or Wissenschaften, or approaches to knowledge, in German culture at the time that Freud was writing. Now, I think that Bettelheim is bending the stick a little bit here, making it seem as if Freud never spoke of psychoanalysis in relation to the natural sciences, which he did. But what Bettelheim is reclaiming and insisting on is very significant, that he's insisting that of the two traditions of scientific inquiry, the natural sciences um, and the uh, human sciences, or the sciences of the spirit, or the hermeneutic spiritual sciences, uh, uh, was, uh, was, was what Freud was really up to. So Freud was it, it developing psychoanalysis as one of the human sciences, not as a natural science. So these human sciences, or Geisteswissenschaften, sciences of the spirit, are, Bettelheim notes, ideographic, that is, they're concerned with a case-by-case -case analysis, because they seek to understand the objects of their study, not as instances of universal laws, but as singular events. So their method is that of history. That's what we're concerned with, insofar as we're doing science in psychoanalysis. Only that. 
And so he claims that Freud was working within the framework of the Geisterswissenschaften, the sciences of the spirit, and applying methods that was, were appropriate to an ideographic science. So this distinction is designed to realign psychoanalysis as a human science, something that many adherents of the natural sciences would see as actually unscientific. Okay? The third issue concerns scientific realism, which has grown in influence in the last uh, 30 or 40 years as a, an attempt to engage in a kind of reconstruction of science in a more kind of radical way. And uh, Bettelheim's way out, of course, is to seek refuge in a, a kind of hermeneutic or humanistic or spiritual mode of psychoanalysis that's set against the kinds of psychology that adhere to the natural sciences in the English-speaking world. But there's also, and this is what I want to talk about now, there's also a deeper critique available of the appeal to the natural sciences by psychologists, uh, the kind of psychologists who uh, uh, want, want to, uh, to kind of like work with psychoanalysis um, and uh, has important consequences for the relationship between psychoanalysis and psychology as a, as a natural science. If, if psychology is a natural science, which I also doubt. Um, and the key text here is a book uh, called The Explanation of Social Behaviour by a social psychologist, Paul Secord, and more significantly, a philosopher of science called Rom Hare. And it's Hare who first trained as a chemical engineer and mathematician who noticed that there was something seriously wrong in what we might call um, social scientists' uh, idea of what the natural sciences were. Something seriously wrong, very seriously wrong, Harry argues, uh, in the way that psychologists look to the natural sciences and imagine that what they're doing is a natural science, when in fact they misunderstand what the natural sciences are doing. And Harry argues that we should notice the ways in which natural sciences like chemistry proceed by constructing models of their specific kinds of objects that they're concerned with, objects that are conceptualized as having certain powers that are then examined in detailed case studies. So if we want to be scientific, that's what we should be doing in psychology and in, and in psychoanalysis. So the point is that the, the image of the scientist accumulating measurements of law-like regularities, one that's prevalent among psychologists, uh, does, doesn't correspond at all to what the natural sciences are doing most of the time. So the problem is not so much that there are uh, those who flee from science into mysticism, though that is a problem as well, um, but the problem is that there are those who try to model their research on what they think the natural sciences are up to. So here, Hare is addressing the mainstream psychologists and showing the mainstream psychologists that you need to change paradigms if you really want to be a science, rather than do all of this sort of ridiculous laboratory experimental stuff that is not scientific at all, you need as Harry and Secord put it in their book, The Explanation of Social Behaviour, you need to treat people for scientific purposes as if they were human beings. Yeah? So we need to be questioning what the scientific purposes are rather than simply claiming to be scientific as such. Now let's turn to the fourth issue, which is the issue of language games. Harre's alternative is an approach to human action that is, um, as Freud might have said, a part of science, that is, close to science, while not actually claiming to be a fully-fledged science. And that brings us to a version of Wittgensteinian theory. 
like theory after the uh, philosopher of science, uh, of language, Ludwig uh, Wittgenstein, uh, who started his work uh, studying in Manchester University in 1910, by the way. Uh, in fact, Haray's own trajectory was through speech act theory in the work of J.L. Austin, and in that way linked with the work of Wittgenstein, and also linked with the work of Lev Vygotsky, who was, among other things, one of the founders of the Russian Psychoanalytical Society, something that's often forgotten in the psychology textbooks. Now, J.L. Austin was a uh, uh, philosopher of language, uh, working on what was called uh, ordinary language philosophy, looking at how language operated uh, in social context. And his book, How to Do Things with Words, delineates the subtle work of language, both in its performative dimension, that is, language is not simply descriptive, but language has effects on the social relations that it operates in. Huh? It's not outside the world, but it's in the world, having effects on the world as it speaks about the world. Exactly the kind of argument that Judith Butler then takes up and develops queer theory from uh, 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 as well. And uh, this argument has consequences uh, for the speaker, uh, often unbeknownst to them. The performative dimension of language means, because we're implicated in the social relations that we're describing, it has effects on us as speakers. And we can't control those, those effects. So this obviously chimes with what we're talking about uh, when we're trying to enable the talking cure to take place in the clinic and encouraging people to reflect on the consequences of the ways that they speak. It has consequences for them, subjectively, as they speak. So that also instantiates the language games that Wittgenstein describes, and that phrase, language games, is much misunderstood uh, uh, in, in human practice. And it's tempting, of course, to, to simply dismiss a scientific account as being just yet another language game, but... To say that is a language game is precisely to attend to the rules and conditions, what Austin would call the felicity conditions, in which claims we make are accountable. So a game is not just a game, but if you're looking at it as a game, you need to understand what the rules and consequences are. So to say it is a game is to take it very seriously. So these conditions demand, to borrow, borrow a phrase from Freud, the intellectual working over of carefully scrutinized observations. Here, we take those activities as a necessarily social activities. So this does justice to the nature of human action in such a way that it's in tune with scientific inquiry, it rests upon the model of the human subject that is intrinsically reflexive um, and uh, uh, is, is a very useful way of thinking about what psychoanalysis is about as a kind of language game. Maybe a scientific language game. No? Okay, let's talk about that. The fifth uh, field uh, is the field of practice scientific practice. So in these, in these different characterizations of science, we're always confronted with the, the domain of ideals, of forms of knowledge that are abstracted from human action, abstracted from practice. And so if we, as psychoanalysts, are to engage with science, we need to work through our relation to science in such a way that distinguishes its imaginary aspects, that is, whether we admire and identify with it or try to avoid it and differentiate ourselves from it, we need to differentiate those imaginary aspects from its symbolic function. More importantly, we need to notice how scientists themselves imagine and symbolize their attempts to do what they do. 
And this is exactly where the tradition of ethnographic and analytical studies of scientific knowledge is useful. Uh, sociology of scientific knowledge, that kind of tradition. And that kind of tradition attends either explicitly or implicitly to the way that uh, uh, studies of science um, are, 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 are trying to avoid being scientistic, that is, avoid trying to simply mimic what science is, but thinking of science as social relations. This is one of the key phrases in the, in the critical literature on the uh, studies of science. Science is social relations. So there's an attention in this tradition to the way that science emerges historically as a form of practice, and then to the, the messy, contradictory ways that scientists account for what they do. So it's very clear from these studies of scientific knowledge that natural scientists, the ones that we might idealize as the real scientists in this debate about how psychoanalysis positions itself, these real scientists do not actually adhere to the methods and procedures described in their own textbooks. They don't do it like that. So we have another way of thinking and uh, kind of disentangling what science is, here thinking of science as a social practice, a real social practice, rather than something that's idealized and then kind of like reduced to a set of formula that, that people think that they should follow in order to be scientists. So the world of science, real science, is as much infused with hunches and intuitions and power plays as is psychoanalysis. And the linear up the hill model of the accumulation of scientific knowledge is unraveled by those who try to make sense of it through describing paradigms and those who try to make sense of it as consisting of different ideological agendas. And I'm thinking here of the work of Donna Haraway, uh, who follows in this tradition of studies of scientific knowledge, but with a, a particular critical feminist uh, angle on it. So scientific practice configures itself as a form of knowledge, but when it comes down to it, psychoanalysis is not even a form of knowledge, still less a worldview, and instead it questions, it helps us question what our relation to knowledge is. Okay, I should wind up this. Yes. Got time to wind up? Oh, yes. Okay, right, okay. So one of the lessons from the studies of scientific knowledge is that no one ever only follows rational methodological, methodological procedures. We're all divided subjects. We're divided not only between what we imagine science to be and suspicion of knowledge, but also between experience and expertise. And that's also, incidentally, why manualized psychotherapy that pretends to be scientific, that pretends to tidy things up in the name of evidence, it always fails. We are, Beckelheim reminds us, operating in the realm of something that is meaningful, even when we may pull back from meaning to realize that there's no complete system of meaning from which to view what now appears to us in analysis to be intrinsically meaningless and stupid about our lives. I think that's one of the aims of psychoanalysis, actually. <clears throat> so psychoanalysts put their bets on the capacity of human beings to change, and that reflexive ability, which is highlighted in attempts to argue for an approach to subjectivity that is more faithful to its object of study, in tune with the best, most innovative aspects of natural science, it cannot only be scientific in its commonly understood sense. We can transform what we describe. We're not simply mindlessly reproducing reality as it appears to us. So psychoanalysis would be nothing, pointless, if it did not, as Freud argued, accentuate and work with and value the negative characteristics of what appears to be a worldview. So we insist that it is not a worldview, and if we take science seriously, we need to insist that psychoanalysis is not a science either.
Okay. Chris Dunker, yeah. over to you. Can then we'll I, have can I ask a quick question? Yeah, maybe. If I'll ask. Um, it probably is very what you said, but one of my understandings of a requirement for science is that it has an object. Now, obviously, the natural sciences are in you know, the natural world and various aspects of it. Human sciences are looking at how human behaviour like. But what is the object of psychoanalysis? Now, I've heard it said that it's the unconscious. Well, that may please depend, relies on whether you believe in the unconscious. I'm just wondering where, how you deal with those two issues. Is this something you're going to talk about, Chris? Well, let's can, see. Can, 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 can we let that bubble away and then return to it when Chris is finished? Yeah. Great question. It's a good question. Yeah. Yeah. Good question. Yes. Yeah. Um, uh, thank you. Your long. Okay, thanks for coming. I would express my. Many thanks to you and to you. Uh, many years here at Manchester uh, doing my uh, permanent formation with Eric and Ian and with you. It's a pleasure and an honor for me to talk with you again. And I, I will start with a question. Uh, it's a good question. Um, my, my book, uh, my recent research is uh, is a kind of an answer to some uh, historical objections against psychoanalysis. And uh, one of them is, uh, which is the object of psychoanalysis? And uh, the main first uh, wrong answer is uh, unconscious. Unconscious isn't an object. Unconscious is a hypo hypothesis. And so what's, what's, uh, what's psychoanalysis about? And uh, if, if we go to Freud, we, uh, we, we, we have lots of answers for this uh, simple, small, and very, very interesting question. Uh, the object of psychoanalysis is, uh, are dreams. The object of psychoanalysis are uh, frightened slips. The uh, object of psychoanalysis is uh, um, neurosis, symptoms, uh, anxieties. Uh, the object of psychoanalysis Lots of uh, simple, um, silly, in some sense, uh, phenomena. And this answer is in some, um, some points similar as the answer you can um, have for, for some, uh, some uh, Darwinian researchers. If you ask Darwin theory, which is the object of Darwin theory? Oh, okay. the, which, which is the object of Darwinian theory? Darwinian theory. Darwinian theory. But what we are, what we are researching in the Darwinian theory? The evolution? No. The evolution is the hypothesis. A hypothesis about what? Ah, lots of little uh, phenomena uh, from uh, the shape of a uh, um, news of a, of a bird, uh, geological uh, transformations, uh, rests of bones here and over there. This, uh, this type of, 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 of theory that, uh, that objectivates uh, to explain lots of phenomena. This, these are a kind of epistemological uh, characteristics uh, of uh, some theories that appears in the beginning of the 19th century, uh, like Darwin, uh, like um, thermo thermodynamic theory, like um, uh, relativity theory, and so on. Uh, so we have uh, to take Freud and the birth of psychoanalysis into the, its own epistemological historical context. They are bigger theories. The are theories that uh, want to explain lots of little things with some simple hypothesis, like or as uh, unconscious. Uh, in some sense, mm, historical materialism isn't a kind of a theory aspiring to be a scientific theory as Freud, as Darwin, as uh, those uh, 
huge theories we, we do not have anymore in science those days. That's why, is the first point, we uh, look to psychoanalysis as a kind of an old science. Uh, um, a science uh, connected with Freud, the author or the founder, father, founding father of, the, of this, uh, this new science. And that uh, produces an immediate uh, critic, critic that this is, this is in science for our day. This is an old science. It, it was considered a science, but not today. Not today anymore. Okay? Can, can, carry on, Chris. Yeah. Uh, let me explain the, conce uh, the con context of this, uh, this, this book. It is an answer. It is an answer to a very popular book um, uh, that appears in two. 2022, 20, 20, just after the pandemia, uh, wrote by uh, Natalia Pasternak and uh, Orsi. Uh, they are biologists, biologists. They have an extreme important uh, place in the battle against negationism during uh, the COVID um, uh, pandemia. And Brazil? I don't know if you know, uh, we have a split because president, because lots of people in, in the um, uh, health uh, politics said, oh, we do not need the vaccines. Uh, we have to wait. Uh, maybe this is uh, only a flu. Uh, don't buy vaccines and, and things like that. And the result is Brazil uh, have... Um, <laughs> Six sixteen thousand uh, death that that people uh, causes by uh, caused by um, uh, COVID, uh, and we estimate there is an excess of a thousand hundred people died uh, in consequence of this politics, because people divide the opinion about having or not having vaccine. Uh, because uh, the, the, the government uh, is saying we are not sure this is good. We has no, the, the science is not uh, completely in favor to have vaccines and so on. We have a, we have a political health uh, battle during uh, COVID that killed people, that killed hundreds of uh, thousands of people. So uh, those guys um, make a front with psychoanalysts saying, no, we need vaccines. This is a kind of negationism. This is a kind of um, false science. Uh, this is ideology. Don't trust uh, on these um, fake um, representants of a um, health uh, system. And at the end, um, people uh, start to vaccinate and accept vaccines and so on. But one year after this, those two guys that uh, work with us uh, uh, published a book called uh, Silly Things or Bobaging. How do you translate on Bobaging? Nonsense things we, we, we mustn't accept anymore. And it's a list of uh, false theories or theories that wouldn't um, uh, demand respect, wouldn't demand public money, wouldn't demand um, uh, the, the option to be treated by uh, from, from ordinary people. And the list compounds by uh, homeopathy, our Vedic medicine, familiar constellation, um, Lots of things and psychoanalysis. You say, come on. Uh, we know there's a controversial, historical controversial around epistemological foundations on psychoanalysis. We know psychoanalysis is a, is, is a part of its uh, foundations um, connected to language science, anthropology, um, philosophy of science. Uh, uh, bi biology, but it's unfair to say it, it is a pseudo 
uh, science in order to say they are pretending to be a science. They are, they are, they are faking science. Avoid psychoanalysis and avoid psychoanalysis and avoid all those uh, ten um, savoirs, uh, kind of uh, knowledges and practice. Uh, so uh, we have to confront science, of course, as a social, institutional way of knowledge connected to uh, universities, connected to uh, industrial interests, but we have to deal with science as a popular representation. And we have to deal uh, with the concept of pseudoscience as a kind of uh, ideological attack against psychoanalysis, not a proper, actual, well-found uh, found, um, attack to psychoanalysis. And um, this, 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 uh, this is the main uh, issue we have to, to discuss. Because, and here goes my uh, arguments, uh, uh, that could be a very good uh, moment to discuss uh, critically, uh, politically, eth ethically, what is the purposes of science today, not science in the Freudian area, uh, and what what what, what what was based on our, our trust and confidence in science is made about what? We are really uh, in position to explain what we are doing in social, uh, psychological, uh, anthropological areas in terms of science. Oh, what, what, what is going on today? This is the main um, purpose of this book as a answer book. Yeah. We are not talking about psychoanalysis from inside, but uh, from these, admitting this discourse and taking this discourse of a kind of a ideological movement of, of our uh, period. Uh, that, that then goes the demonstration. Yeah? First of all, pseudoscience uh, as um, diagnostic proposed by uh, Popper in uh, 1963 in Conjectures and Refutation. And uh, if you go to Popper and see in which basis are, are, are uh, raised the, his arguments, it, it's, they, are, they, are, they are clearly poor, very poor. Uh, they, they are um, based on a friend uh, connection with Alfred Adler. Alfred Adler and Popper work in a social intervention in, uh, in, in Vienna uh, in between the two wars. And uh, Adler, working with child, children with, uh, with no family, child in, uh, in, uh, in, in institutions and in schools and, and so on, uh, deals with, uh, with, 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 with a case and uh, Popper asked, why do this what you are doing? What was the reason for this uh, intervention? And Aller says, as so many clinicians said, I, uh, I deal with, with, with cases like this for 100 times. And Popper said, 100 times? Let me see the, the 100 case studies. And Aller said, no, this this is not the way we, we deal with this when we are in a clinical field. And Popper was completely uh, astonished with this, uh, with this idea and uh, go home and uh, written a kind of uh, experimental, mental experimental, completely crazy. It's about uh, throwing a boy in a river and uh, why uh, one guy uh, saves the boy and the other guy do not save the boy. Psychoanalysis has nothing to do with, the, with this kind of problem, but he produces this mental experiment to say, and, and lots of other arguments, to say psychoanalysis is pseudo-scientific. Okay, but uh, Popperians, uh, goes ahead and uh, say, in many sense, lots of um, the hypotheses and uh, observations of psychoanalysis are not refu refutable. 
They are not deniable. And uh, this was the main uh, idea that psychoanalysis is described in pseudo-psychoanalysis in the 60s, because the, the formulations of Freud about the dream uh, were not non, uh, properly uh, refutable. This argument was, was, uh, was taken from uh, Wittgenstein, uh, which analyzed uh, a cousin of, uh, one cousin of uh, Wittgenstein was analyzed by Freud, and Freud proposes some interpretations about dreams, and uh, she comments uh, with Wittgenstein, Wittgenstein said, uh, this, is, this is not an explanation. This is not a, a proper connection between cause and effects. And he wrote about this, uh, saying, no, psychoanalysis is, is interesting, but it is statics. It's not knowledge. And Popper take the same argument and uh, reproduce it, saying there are, there are some huge theories that we have to avoid, namely, psychoanalysis, Marx, Nietzsche, and Darwin. We forgot that, but it's uh, it's on the Popper Popper uh, writings. Uh, Darwin is uh, is uh, metaphysics. You can prove Darwin uh, hypothesis by collecting so many uh, little uh, phenomena and explaining uh, a huge process. There is no experiment to prove uh, to prove the Darwinian uh, theory and and, and 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 so forth and and so forth. Uh, and a plus more, uh, Popper has a kind of a, a theoretical alliance with the economic theory. Uh, he was a friend of Friedrich Hayek, the main uh, theoretical guy of the neoliberalism, with von Mises and uh, a bunch of people uh, and good economists that uh, think together in the 40s a kind of uh, anti-totalitarian uh, economic theory against Marx, against uh, uh, what, uh, what, what, uh, any, any, any type of economic theory that uh, brings us uh, the reflection about society. And the first book from uh, von Mises, as a textbook, begins with psychology. It calls the praxeology or something like that. Or oh, that means in the beginning of economic theory, we have to, uh, psychology. That's why Popper is uh, uh, refusing psychoanalysis as a, a problematic uh, theory because uh, he's saying uh, economics depends on, 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 on uh, philo philosophy or history and depends on uh, psychology. Uh, but, but Five minutes? Yeah? Five minutes? Just five minutes? No! <laughs> no! <laughs> yeah. uh, just, just throw uh, away some ideas. Uh, summarizing. Uh, we have uh, new researchers since 2008 saying long time psychodynamic therapy, that is, a methodological renaming of psychoanalysis. Uh, if you go to the definition, uh, at least 53 encounters with interpretation on uh, basing on transfers, this is a paragraph. No psychoanalyst will rec recognize himself in, in that thing, but this is a methodological uh, production in order to produce data, data uh, of efficacy and uh, efficiency. Uh, and these two, two guys from the University of Hamburg prove, present a meta-analysis uh, pointing that psychodynamic, uh, long-term psychodynamic psychotherapy is specified in this terms cure a hundred more than any other psychotherapeutic approach. A hundred more. And we need 200 uh, researchers, trials, to deny this affirmation. 2008, same date, we have the crisis of neoliberalism. And uh, of course, the American says, no, you do not uh, uh, use proper uh, statistics. You, you have problems here and prob problems there. And they remake uh, the, the, the research. And the results were 
a little uh, less uh, robust, but in in uh, in the same in the same direction. Uh, new uh, attacks from uh, the Dutch and uh, American uh, statistics researchers say no, still uh, no good, and they do a third research saying no, uh, our, our our patterns uh, are good enough. They are good enough to compare with the other uh, research we have to those days in uh, psychotherapeutic efficacy and uh, uh, efficiency. And uh, these are the results. And last year, the World Psychiatric Journal, the most important journal and psychiatric um, published by American Psychiatric Association, um, Runs with a with a with a with an article saying yes, we have to admit psychoanalysis and a uh, long defined as a long time um, uh, psychodynamic therapy is so efficient, is so efficacy as any other based evident uh, psychotherapy form of psychotherapy. See. Uh, the critics of uh, those fellows uh, that psychoanalysis isn't uh, useful is wrong. It's empirically wrong. But <laughs> that means that psychoanalysis is a science. Uh, this, this is this could led us to the conclusion of psychoanalysis is science because because we have to interpret this data. And the problem is what is operating in this core. What, what is the, the um, active principle uh, you are um, doing, uh, using to have these results? Is the person of the psychoanalyst? Is the speaking, is the speaking and uh, interpretation? Which kind of interpretation is uh, the illness, neurosis, psychosis, borderline, and so on? The results are so difficult. Then we we realize the whole story is based on false principles. That which is the, the false principles? Which kind of article? Which kind of uh, impact uh, of article? Which kind of reproduction of uh, the article? And so on. So one of the renews of the concept of uh, pseudoscience. <laughs> Uh, take from uh, take the idea from Popper and uh, um, renew it. Say yes, we have pseudoscience, but why are we so obsessed with so, uh, pseudoscience and uh, uh, so less obsessed with pseudo technology? Pseudo technology means uh, a technology of data, a technology of producing data, a technology of certifying an, uh, uh, objects, hypotheses, uh, and uh, articles, and areas, and disciplines, and so on. This is a production of, of um, pseudo-technology, because this is not science. And this is, what, what, what is it? The, the whole bunch of uh, normativity we have uh, those days about Publishing a book, publishing an article, uh, having your article accepted in, 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 in health politics and so on. This is not psycho uh, science anymore. This is pseudo-technology producing a kind of certification on what, on, on what is science. And this is a very interesting uh, idea for psychoanalysis and its historical complex uh, connection with psychoanalysis because in some sense we are science uh, but in another sense we are not science. Uh, we are kind of a symptom of a science, uh, a kind of incompleteness, uh, testimony of incompleteness of science. And so this is being, uh, being raised up with uh, those uh, new critics about uh, science at all and uh, mental health science in, in particular. Uh, because we have this, I don't know if it is a consensus here in, in Britain, we have a, we have a, a crisis in, uh, in, in mental health uh, because the paradigms of treatments are not function. Uh, there's no uh, uh, new medications. Uh, the, 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 um, the old medication is doing what they what they, they could do. 
So the question raises uh, on uh, what is psychoanalysis and what is science. Psychoanalysis, Freud said, is a new Wissenschaft. And Wissenschaft is a good term. Let me close this, but it's a very interesting uh, term in German because it uh, goes to the verb Wissen, that means savoir, not knowledge. Science is one thing. Wissenschaft is another thing. Wissenschaft is a kind of uh, field of... Um, of um, how can we explain? Um, of um, when we deal with a patient, we did, did not deal with the knowledge of the patient, but the savoir of the patient. What he thinks about this, what she thinks about that, and and so on. It's kind of a of a, a, a soft uh, concept in relation to the knowledge as uh, taught by science. And this, uh, this division is fairly in, important to reintroduce in the debate of science, in the debate around public rationality, uh, the savoir of the origin people, indigenous, subaltern populations, uh, women, gays and lesbians, and so on. Lots of epistemologies were excluded from this massive normative exception of uh, science. And why? why? Uh, because we uh, produce this uh, techno-science that excludes uh, the knowledge, as Ian was, was, was uh, uh, explaining, from uh, human ordinary people, as Wittgenstein wants, and so on. Psychoanalysis is a new um, uh, Wissenschaft. Psychoanalysis is a method, method to treat uh, people. So we, we, we are not interested in being psycho, uh, sci scientists uh, with our patients. We are, we are interested in, in, in making them uh, to have a better life. It's, it's no science. It's science is behind this. And Freud said, yes, uh, psychoanalysis is also a forschung. Forschung, this is a German verb, to a kind of philosophy and scientist thinker. If uh, we can admit there is a mixture of criticize of science and science, uh, we can grasp the sense of forschung. And he said, psychoanalysis is a new science, psychoanalysis is a method, and psychoanalysis is a forschung. Uh, let's go back to the, to the 20s. And Lacan uh, introduces two uh, more uh, uh, definitions. Psychoanalysis is an ethics. Okay, let's let's uh, discuss which kind of ethics. And psychoanalysis is uh, a discourse or a social bond, as Ian has uh, uh, defend uh, here. Psychoanalysis and science. We are we are going to discuss this. Uh, they are world visions. But uh, since we introduce in world visions uh, not only the comparison between religions and science. Religions and science and the experiment of Soviets, as uh, Freud talked talk in, in, in the 32 conference. We have to, to, to uh, criticize uh, and in some sense uh, uh, produce new concept of uh, Welt and Schaum. For example, naturalism and totemism. These two real, uh, world views are together defining what is, what is science today. But we have another world views that we have to listen to uh, as animism, as perspectivism, as uh, other uh, ways of producing Anschauung. Not only the idea that Anschauung is the whole, a totality, a metaphysics, uh, ideology, but the idea that the the, com, uh, the crisis or the conflict between world uh, visions is important to define what is the world vision. We need we, we have to anthropologize world, the, the the concept of world visions. And that's Thank it. you. That's it. That's it. Right. Oh.
could listen to you all day, Chris, but we do need to have some time for discussion. I was just, when you were speaking about the, um, the, the pseudo um, technologies and the sort of publishing industries, I was uh, thinking about um, how a colleague of a uh, former colleague, a colleague of some, a uh, former colleague of some of the people in this room, Maggie McClure, um, <coughs> uh, described the technology of systematic review um, as uh, clarity bordering on stupidity. So, uh, <laughs> do you remember that? <laughs> um, so we now have some time for until sort of yeah, like um, half an hour or so for responses, for um, questions, discussion. Um, if people could say something about, about themselves, you know, um, and what brings them to ask this question, perhaps, as, uh, as a way of introducing themselves into the room and, and to our speakers, that would be really helpful. Could, could I come back while it's on my mind? Who I are can, you? Well, I, I, I'm appearing here today courtesy of the Darwinian hypothesis. Okay. I'm, I'm, I'm a human. Uh -huh. And I'm quite proud of some of the theories that have been made around me. And I suppose as an object of science, I sort of feel really reasonably robust. And there's been quite a history of sciences about me as a human. And I suppose, just going back to my original question of to what extent does a science require that it has an object? I suppose I could translate the question into what is the actual status of that object? It seems to me that what it, it seems to me it seems to move into sort of being a process rather than a sort of firm object. Like I, I'm a sort of part-time student of Badieu who gives fairly short shift to us humans. He's, he's talking about subjects who are constantly having their parameters defined every day of the week such that a human is never stable. But in a sense, but I think that's sort of the point that you're making, that there is an ongoing process that you can never actually pin it down except as some sort of never-ending method. But I, but I suppose I'm still wanting to sort of get a bit more precision over how you are understanding the object of science that is psychoanalysis. Like you can see it as an endless iterative process that never really sort of gets to its point. I'm just trying to sort of see to what extent can you make it sort of more succinct as an object that actually has a bit of solidity like a human, like the physical world, like yeah. chemistry. Uh, so do you want to take that up or do you want to collect together some more responses? Well, other people might have answers to that as yeah, well. So let's true. open it up a little bit, mm -hmm. shall we? Yeah. Well, yeah, so I'm not question. Question. <laughs> no, I have an answer. No. So I'm Luan, uh, and I'm an early career researcher, somehow trained by the three of you in different levels, which put the question that uh, you mentioned, Christian, the pseudo technologies. Mm -hmm. And I wonder whether in the debate about psychoanalysis as a science, there are issues, com current issues about funding. Mm -hmm. Funding and think about shrinking funding, public funding, to healthcare, mm -hmm. so psychoanalysis as a practice in the healthcare system, whether, uh, whether there are uh, therapists working in the NHS or SUS in Brazil, but also in terms of research uh, and applying for scientific mm -hmm. research funding for the, science, the, for the funding from the funding bodies, and even whether, when we are working on psychoanalysis, we should apply to the Social Science Council or the Humanities and Arts <laughs> Council or neither. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So all mm -hmm. those questions that, I mean, and when we say that psychology is not a science, how do we deal with this pragmatic aspect mm -hmm. of funding and being excluded from funding mm -hmm. applications? So that's a kind of turning the question on its head, what is the subject of psychoanalysis mm -hmm. as well as the object? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Do we have... Do you want to take up these questions together, or do we have some more? Let's see if anyone else has a, a thought. Yeah. I, I, I kind of have, like, a thought that's related to this question. Um, partly because I think, like, for me, it's important to ask if he gets to be a human. 
and um, the kind of maybe have psychoanalysis like destabilizes those sort of categories, but also as we like seeing every day at the moment, obviously not everyone is considered a human that is like a body worth a life mm -hmm. or having a life. Um, but also I'm kind of there's something interesting to me about asking for the asking about an object of psychoanalysis and I can't help but hear the echo of, of JR, which <laughs> is that. Yeah. So the object oh. in some ways does not yeah. exist in yeah. this way. Yeah. Um, and how that is uh, I don't know, there's something I think generative about then saying, okay. Maybe we take the object as that, but the subject is something different. So mm -hmm. A subject kind of always in uh, proximity to lack, but not the same as lack. So I think mm -hmm. this question I also guess of like, what is the subject of psychoanalysis? Maybe unconscious can be a subject of psychoanalysis, if not mm -hmm. an object, but also mm -hmm. like, um, Love this formulation of hypothesis. To mm -hmm. me, it was such a like terrifying moment, mm -hmm. actually. Mm -hmm. So next to me as well. Yeah. So that's yeah. not a question. That's yeah. <laughs> just yeah. some react like reaction. <laughs> <laughs> so that's the precise answer. We, me and and, and Jules and Yanini, try to avoid in our our answer because it is an internal uh, uh, answer. Uh, we need to. Uh, the concept of uh, object A and R, I think it's a good, a good, a good concept. Uh, but how to translate it uh, to the worldwide uh, scientific epistemology? Yeah? How to uh, impede uh, to uh, position us in a kind of a religious uh, position when uh, where you 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 claim. Yeah, your, uh, your interlocutor to admit uh, Laka in the heart and then everything is going to be saluted. <laughs> you see, uh, we, we, we cannot do that. We, we do not want to do this uh, internal epistemology because uh, one uh, interpretation of this phenomena that we are being attacked, attacked in order to be excluded from uh, uh, public debate is uh, the, we, 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 we turn back to science and, uh, and, and the justification of psychoanalysis, psychoanalysis outside its own institutions, outside its own uh, uh, way of uh, producing and reproducing a psychoanalytical discourse. Uh, thing, things that are going on uh, those days in Brazil, the psychoanalysis is going outside from their um, own institutions demand a uh, discourse to uh, debate with, uh, with uh, uh, general epistemology. Uh, but your question is, um, has, has a kind of a translation, uh, that is, uh, trying to answer the reformulation of the question. What, what is about in the old regard psychoanalysis? We can answer, psychoanalysis is to the uh, particular phenomena connected to language. Yeah, an extension of linguistic, rhetoric, uh, language uh, uh, theory, and so on. And in this uh, great field, we are interested in a particular um, trace of human language, but not only uh, for principle Hume, human uh, language, this is negativity. Uh, negativity, the, 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 the idea that uh, language in human can uh, support metaphor, support line, support uh, suppositions, support everything that uh, is deduced, deduced by the uh, performativity, uh, negativity of language, as the object of what we are studying, uh, of our uh, um, uh, research program. Because we understand this negativity of language as connected, has some etiological power, 
to explain or to redefine what is suffering, what is symptom, what is uh, uh, anguish, what is inhibition, or what is, uh, is uh, the clinical purpose of psychoanalysis. So it's, it's a confront because we are not only claiming that uh, we have this special uh, task force on negativity on, uh, on, on the language, but this implies, redefine what is um, psychopathology. We, we couldn't accept uh, psychopathology defined only po by positive behavior, uh, ways of performing uh, and social life and education and so on. It's it's a it's a critic, but it's a critic in, uh, connected to uh, what uh, Lua uh, raised up. Uh, when when who's going to pay for this hypothesis? Uh, since the eighties, we are discussing uh, transdisciplinary studies, uh, um, uh, transversal epistemologies. The necessity to to make uh, mixtures in, in epistemology to to converge and to produce uh, produce converging science between anthropology, philosophy, uh, genetics, and and so on. But at the moment, we said no. We need some kind of a hybridization in a disciplinary uh, distribution of money. No one is going to pay for the hybrids. The hybrids are outside. We want to see. You are in philosophy or you are in anthropology or you are in human science or social science. This is, this is wrong. This is wrong. And this is an empirical proof about why psychoanalysis is, is, is in a, in a, hybridization, a hybridization, uh, upon, uh, among uh, various uh, sciences or pseudoscience or human science. I don't know. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think this question about who gets to be a human is, is, is really interesting and really important. And I think it, it kind of connects with the point that Chris ended up with um, at the end of his talk just now, which is this question of views. It's not about a Weltanschauung. It's not about one worldview mm -hmm. that will explain everything, but it's about an attention to different views that there are of the world. And in mm -hmm. psychoanalysis, this takes two forms, at least two forms. One form is the way that we listen to someone speak in the clinic of their views, their views of the world and their mm -hmm. views of themselves, and it, we attend to those views. We're not interested in imposing a worldview mm -hmm. or fitting them into a worldview uh, in order to, to bring about the treatment. We're interested in listening to what their views are. And I think the other aspect, which is becoming even more important now with the uh, feminist and decolonial movements, is to think about views as being from particular positions, positions of the oppressed, mm -hmm. positions of different uh, uh, aspects of society that have things to say about the nature of society and the nature of subjectivity that we need to listen to. Again, it's not about saying, okay, that fits within the Weltanschauung, that fits within the scientific scientific worldview and that should be kept out but it's about acknowledging those different views of the world and noticing what um, what critiques they bring and what transformations in knowledge they bring about mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and all of this <laughs> has a bearing uh, on how we think of psychoanalysis at a particular point in history in a particular kind of culture as a particular way of listening to human beings as they are now. Uh, psychoanalysis wasn't around at the time of Spartacus or uh, kind of like in here, there, in every culture, and neither will it exist uh, in a uh, in hundred uh, thousand years' time. Psychoanalysis is a particular way of, of practicing what it is to listen to speaking beings at this moment. And I think the danger with the um, kind of pseudo-technology um, argument which tries to define what efficacy in psychoanalysis and psychotherapy is, a particular kind of danger in trying to turn psychoanalysis into a real science that has an object that it's clear about, that we can pin down. A real danger of that is that it universalizes psychoanalysis and uh, makes us think 
that the kind of truths that we've arrived at are going to be applicable to everybody everywhere for all time. Mm -hmm. I think it's a real, real danger. I, I think apart from anything else, psychoanalysis is useful for some people and it's useful, useless for a lot of people. So is it enough to encapsulate it as a practice? Sorry? Is it enough to encapsulate it as a valid practice? I think, that's, I think that's one of the lessons that's useful from the studies of scientific knowledge, is that the, the scientific practice works on particular um, hypotheses, good word, um, and a kind of modelling of objects for particular purposes, to bring about particular mm -hmm. effects. That's all. And, and it works within a certain domain of practice, outside that domain of practice mm -hmm. doesn't work. Psychoanalysis doesn't work for everybody. It's useless. Because if someone called Caleb Pitekno who tried to define a science teacher, that's where I got my original question. Mm -hmm. like, and he, he tried to devise a science of teaching, so he had an object. He said there's a science of teaching, there's a science of learning, which I I I, I don't go along. Yeah. Because that that's where it's coming from. It's just trying to work out if it is it actually to say that yes, it's a practice, there's definitely processes in that practice, there's definitely people you can understand about that practice, but can you stop short of wanting to investigate it as a science? I think, I think Alex, is, oh, Art, so Artemis, Alex, Alex, Artemis. Um, a comment and a question from what you, you were both discussing. I think that we agree that psychoanalysis is like a symptom on its own, something that it's symptomatic to science as a worldview, but also in, in the very way that is being formed. It's constantly as a form, in a form of transformation and lack, and it doesn't have an object of inquiry, if that's what you are asking for, in my opinion. And while you were speaking, I was thinking that the way that you approach psychoanalysis and science the, it's opening questions around psychoanalysis and the regulation of the profession. So I would like you to unpack more how this push and um, pressure for psychoanalysis to mm -hmm. admit of whether it's not is a science and of being so difficult to understand that it's literally at the border of, of being inside and outside scientific mm -hmm. discourse. Mm -hmm. What is going on when now we are fighting around the regulation of the profession? So, to come back to your question around who is the subject of psychoanalysis, what's going on when we are trying to regulate certain Ooh. subjects within the profession? Mm. 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 Good question. Mm. Because one of the main problems we will address this, this point is uh, science turns into the guarantee for use of reason in public space. So this is a kind of a judgment. Uh, you, you can fight uh, in your own interests and in your own demands, but science is a kind of a, a certificate of validation for the uh, decisions we are going to make not only uh, uh, science, but uh, science is an important um, um, consignation to 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 democracy, uh, and uh, that's that's a problem because we uh, mm -hmm. tend to deny other forms of rationality. If science doesn't recognize this. Ah, this is static, this is religious, this is, this is something that is, is not reason, that does not belong to reason anymore. And uh, psychoanalysis don't, doesn't want to stay with, with this kind of uh, epistemology because this uh, displays it from the conflict area, the conflict zone. When we uh, talk about um, um, the, 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 the trainings and the the, the, the social certification of psychoanalysis, we are talking about states. 
And we are talking about the state and science will be the only judges well, to which kind of practice uh, we want. And this is a problem because uh, we don't, uh, we are refusing in some, some uh, way uh, science as a whole and we are refusing the state as a whole uh, as this kind of uh, only, uh, only um, instance define what is a human being. Because we know this uh, recognition is unfair, this recognition is politically, uh, pol politically complex, and it's, uh, it's one wide wheel, world wheel, imposing and producing frontiers, broad, broad borders, and segregation. So we, we don't want to be a completely uh, certificated by, by, by the state. And it's a fight. It's a fight with science. It's a side, uh, fight with, uh, with the state at the same time. Mm -hmm. But we have to admit the desire to participate in the public debate. This is very important. That's, that's why uh, we go to press, we go to universities, we go to, to, to journal, because we want to participate in this uh, public arena not being uh, self-segregated in uh, psychoanalytic institutions and, and defending ourselves from, from public rationality. Mm. Alex wants to... I, well, firstly, thank, thank you all for very rich uh, presentations and, and all the, the conversation in the room. It, my, my brain's uh, and my spirits in a state of fireworks. Um, I want to pick up on some of the, the, the connections you were make, making with language. So a bit, bit about myself, uh, I'm Alex Dunedin, I'm a part of the Psychiatric Survivors Movement and uh, uh, I'm a part of Asylum Magazine. And so I've spent an awful lot of my life having to think about the identities that have been given to me. Um, and I've, I've been interrogating the identities uh, as attributes given, and sometimes as contagion, um, and and how uh, uh, you, uh, picking up on on what was said, how uh, language itself has effects. It's not just a description. Mm -hmm. um, so so I, I I tuned into something you. Uh, said, and I'm going to have to paraphrase it, but it went something like uh, things are often framed uh, as we have a neurotic complex, but sometimes a neurotic complex has us. And I'm interested in societal complexes. Uh, I certainly feel like I've been in the grip of, of one of, of the various ways, but I think there are weather systems of these that we're all trying to negotiate. Um, and, and that led me to um, obviously think about the, uh, the you know, Foucault said, uh, described regimes of knowledge, society causes to be true. Mm -hmm. uh, and Norbert Elias spoke about hierarchies of legitimacy. And these can entirely eclipse the, the human being, the person at the center. And uh, Luci Irigoy, her, mm -hmm. her sense of wonder, I, I, I like that as, as it's been a lovely anchor to find where if you're sitting in front of somebody and thinking you know them and you don't have a, some sense of wonder that, that's infinite, and irreducible, you're not seeing a human being. That's helped me respond to very reductive mm -hmm. identities that I, I, I'm told, this is you, <laughs> and, and how people treat me. Um, no, not everybody, but, uh, so I, I wound up looking at metalinguistics and sort of general semantics and picking up on uh, uh, the Korzybski, Alfred Korzybski spoke about the mm -hmm. difference between the map and the territory. Mm -hmm. uh, and that, um, that's constantly being negotiated 
And it's constantly changing. I mean, the universe, a little something that, that seems to be very true is change. Uh, and this really confounds science in, in its very crystallizing uh, uh, hierarchies that are, are brought into uh, places like universities. So <clears throat> I, I guess I'd like to hear your thoughts on, on whether um, psychoanalysis is, is a practice which, which is more purposive than nominative. Um, so uh, ju just to give an example that, I, that I'm trying to really work with, uh, and this you know, um, is um, Michael Sandel picked up mm -hmm. on an enlightenment perspective that uh, you don't have friends, you just know people who are being friendly. It, it's a verby thing, it's not a noun thing. Mm -hmm. um, and that, that's, I, I'm trying to, but I don't think I'm doing very well, mm -hmm. get under the lid of Saul Kripke and his, his uh, naming and necessity. So again, back, uh, I'm trying to grapple with the language, uh, and it very much is a living thing. Um, um, uh, so, so um, yeah, does, does that resonate with your thoughts on uh, psychoanalysis? Over to you both, sir. I'm surprised with your reference to Alfred Gorbisky. It's a uh, very, very, uh, and some, some classic critics of the Aristotle theory. Uh, and uh, also Sandel uh, and, and, uh, is, is critics of, there's something wrong uh, in the ontology of, uh, of uh, uh, the human being, the homogeneity of uh, uh, who, is, who is the subject of science or what. And uh, Foucault is also a critic of, of this, this kind of uh, um, um, hegemonic subject of, of knowledge. And uh, in fact, uh, psychoanalysis deep, I think, destabilizes uh, this uh, unity of, of the subject and, uh, and confronting one of the frontiers. Uh, this uh, constitutive for, for, for modern subjectivity is, is madness, madness and dream. The two frontiers that exclude someone from the debate, exclude someone from rationality, exclude someone from a human, proper human being. Second analysis since the beginning is saying uh, the reverse of this. Ah, neurosis is a kind of religion, as a kind of particular religion. Uh, neurosis is a kind of art. As the object of art that uh, someone couldn't uh, uh, con uh, see as a, a form of art. Uh, narcissism is a kind of animism. Uh, child, child as a kind of a, a representation. Eric is dealing with this with this uh, thing for for years. Is is an anthropological paradigm for for the others. <laughs> the child is the other. Uh, it's not us, it's them. I don't know if I'm, uh, I'm reading you uh, correctly, but it's uh, the, the women. The women doesn't exist. How many forms of a uh, human being that being treated and recognized uh, beyond oh, 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 um, as a part of the, the subject uh, that is being denied to produce the subject as, as uh, it is. Perversion as a negative of neurosis. Uh, psychosis as a, a, a kind of a example of how our psychology, our uh, psychoanalysis is neurotic or centristic ordinated. We have to do the critics of psychoanalysis from this point of view. And so on, we have uh, Many examples that uh, we are not dealing, we're not trusting in uh, such thing as a human being. 
What is a human being? This is a question. This is an ending. Uh, it's, it's, it's not predefined. So we cannot adhere to a kind of science who predefines what, what is a human being. Mm. I mean, even, even if we think of the way that uh, different diagnostic categories operate in psychoanalysis, they're not used as uh, predefined scientific criteria with a checklist that you can use mm -hmm. to decide whether someone is psychotic or neurotic or uh, obsessional or hysteric or perverse. You know? uh, that doesn't work in that kind of way. And in, in fact, psychoanalysis in its practice goes further uh, in its critique of those diagnostic systems in the way that it conducts and writes up its case histories. I mean, every case history mm -hmm is a particular case. A, a case history is not a case of neurosis to confirm mm -hmm. that neurosis is like this. But every, <laughs> this is every, not every, Aristotelian. every, this is every, not Aristotelian. every case history is a refutation and yeah, a negation yeah. of the knowledge that we have of neurosis. Something new appears. And what psychoanalysis mm -hmm. is concerned with is opening the space for different forms of subjectivity to appear in the speech of the analysand, which defy any scientific criteria that could be used to describe what a human being is. Yeah? Mm -hmm. Around sexuality, gender, uh, ways of life, views of the world, anything like, like mm -hmm. that. And, and I think it does raise... Um, a problem, and it's a problem that I, I think Artemis was raising and Luan was raising in different ways, is how do we then, as psychoanalysts, deal with the funding councils that want us to be in certain kind of categories of work and to say that we're a human science or a social science or a natural science? How do we deal with that? Or how do we deal with the professions who jealously guard their domains of expertise and want to define what should be done, what procedures should be followed, and to mark their territory against the rivals. And we're dealing with those, those kind of problems at the biggest level, level of the state and, and science there, but, but we have to know how to deal tactically with these bodies, with these professional bodies and with these funding bodies in order to um, be able to, uh, let's say, play the game. Yeah? But it's not about playing the game in a cynical way, where you don't believe anything, but it's about knowing what the rules of the game are, so that you're able to write things according to the specifications of the funding body, or to be able to negotiate the, the professional organisation. And to have other groups and networks of um, uh, comrades, colleagues, to whom you're accountable. Uh, I, I think that's that's where psychoanalysis um, is able to sustain itself in its network of other psychoanalysts and in groups like this, where we talk about the ideas and then learn how mm -hmm. to negotiate these other other obstacles, institutional obstacles, which insist on certain definitions of science, certain definitions of knowledge, and. So, what, was your, what was your aspiration this afternoon to argue, in some sense, that psychoanalysis is a science or not? My argument was psychoanalysis is not a science. And I suppose um, I'm particularly concerned at the way in which psychoanalysis is pressed into a certain kind of grid of knowledge by certain kinds of psychoanalysts who want to have legitimacy and validation from state bodies and professional bodies and uh, funding organizations. And in, I'm concerned about the ways in which those psychoanalysts are tempted to fit psychoanalysis into an idealized image of what science is. And in the process, they distort psychoanalysis itself and shut down the spaces for negativity and critique. Mm -hmm. I suppose that's what my concern is. I suppose what also, and we are going to have to finish in a moment, aren't we? What also that leaves uninterrogated is what the subject and object of science is. Mm -hmm. And I was just thinking, just to finish uh, 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 on a sort of popular cultural mm -hmm. note, of um, how, you know, some people have been reading and watching the three-body problem dramatisations, <laughs> yes. yeah? The Netflix series, 
uh, all the Chinese language series. Um, and one of the things that uh, I think I'm talking about the right series now, <laughs> um, that, you know, that, that uh, gets, is, is sort of assumed but, and not remotely questioned is why the scientists would want to kill themselves because mm -hmm. science doesn't appear to work. Yes. Why? <laughs> yes. It's, it's just not, not a question. Yes. Yeah. Yes. And yet the whole plot re revolves yes. around yes. it. Yes. So I think that tells us something. I think we're going to have to finish um, um, as well because these guys are going to have to... Well, we're going over to the encampment now um, to talk about um, community <coughs> psychoanalysis in Brazil and yeah. Palestine and other mm -hmm. places mm -hmm. with these two people. Um, Which is Chris. Well, and Chris mm -hmm. principally and in. Um, but thank you very much for coming and you're welcome to come with us to the encampment too. Yes. Carry on the yeah. conversation yes. in a different and, way. And just to remind you that there's, there oh, are yes. those books there that I really want to um, Not carry pass home. on. Um, and, and please take one of the books if you're interested in and give a donation to... Um, Medical Aid for Palestine, Palestine Trauma Centre yes. or, or some another, other... Another good cause. Okay, <laughs> let's put it like that. Thank you okay. very much. Thank you.